the creative process model. The Theatre Book Duty and Catherine Hunt. Welcome to the Creative Process Podcast, season number two. Today, we have a very special guest. Who's that guest, Catherine? Bobby Moresco. And what has Bobby Moresco done? He's done a lot. He has done a lot. And, and he, he's from New York. He's from New York, which is where we're from. Um, he's an award-winning producer, writer, actor. He's also a director. He's directed over 30 plays. Um, he's won his first Oscar in 2004 for a best original screenplay in the film Crash. Of course, that was directed by Paul Haggis, and we're going to talk about Paul. And then he won another Oscar in 2005 for The Million Dollar Baby, which starred Hilary Swank. Amazing. And Clint Eastwood directed. Um, he's also the founder of Actors Gym, where he actually helps actors, writers develop projects um, in L.A. and in New York. Uh, so today we're going to talk about that creative process, what you do to stir up those creative juices of you, Bobby, and welcome. Welcome to the creative process. All right, Bobby Moresco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. By, by the way, uh, Million Dollar Baby was 2004, Crash was 2005. Oh, that's, that's okay. And I was a, okay. Okay. Uh, I, I was a producer on Million Dollar Baby and I won the Oscar for Crash for writing. I just want to, don't want to fool people. I'm oh. not really that important. Um, you that out. <laughs> that's okay. But, and you've uh, TV too, you know, the Black Donnellys, uh, Falcone. Uh, I mean, it's a whole array. You've done TV, you've done film, you've done stage. Uh, you've covered it all. And Bobby, tell us about the beginning. So we like to know what your upbringing was. Um, you grew up in Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen. How that influenced you as an artist, uh, creator, uh, and some of your projects, such as Falcone and even the Black Donnellys that take, takes place in Hell's Kitchen. So, Yeah, I, I grew up in middle Manhattan. Everyone else called it Hell's Kitchen. We just called it a neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> 10th Avenue and 51st Street. Um, not far from the docks where my father worked, not far from Broadway where all of my friends and girlfriends and mothers and aunts were ushers and usherettes. And so I, I was right there in the middle between Broadway and the docks. And, you know, those were the choices. Um, I became an usher in a play called Candide. Uh, written by Harold Prince, and Harold Prince had this brilliant idea, which was to use ushers in the actual play. And so uh, I was one of the ushers that he put into the play, and I thought, my God, this is pretty cool. People get money for this. So that was the first time I was ever on stage. Um, how and that lit a fire. How exciting was that? And how old were you at that time, Bobby? Well, look up Candide. Uh, I'm going to say it was 73, so... Uh, 20 maybe a little earlier than that mm -hmm. um but that was the first time on stage but I, in truth i i had studied acting before that because i i knew there was an instinct in me that i wanted to go and i went a friend of mine sent me over to a guy named win handman who founded the american place theater so i already had an interest in it so when that happened to me with candide uh i was also trying to make something happen so it was really exciting and Hal Prince was amazing. He was one of the great theater directors of all time. Literally took me and the other ushers into a room and we rehearsed, which was like incredible. Wow. So that was actually the beginning. Um, I tried to make a living as an actor up until 1983 uh, when some strange things happened, bad things happened. My, I lost a brother to the violence on the West Side. Um, it didn't, um, it, it was something that forced me to write more rather than act. Mm. That was in Los Angeles. I said New York, that was in Los Angeles. In 1974, my wife and I, we moved out to Los Angeles where I tried to make a living. Uh, it didn't work out. In 83, I moved back to New York after my brother was killed. And I uh, 
I started writing more with the actors, Jim, a lot more and uh, hardly acting at all, writing and directing. And then in 1998, I had a play that I had written about myself and my family and my brother. And it was done uh, at a 99 seat house um, with Michael Imperioli from The Sopranos and Dan Grimaldi from The Sopranos and Victor Colicchio from The Sopranos, all those guys before everybody, anybody ever heard of The Sopranos, so they were all in it. Huh? What? What was the name of the play? Half Deserted Streets, uh, taken from a T.S. Eliot poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. You should read it. It's quite wonderful. I want to read it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there was a producer from Warner Brothers whose wife was a member of the actor's gym, my company. And he came to see the play and he was impressed. And he gave me my first job to write as a screenwriter. Wow. From the play. And uh, I went home and bought a book on screenwriting because I had never written anything. I had no idea how to do it. First book I bought was Sid Field's Screenplay. Yeah, I know. Because, yeah, everybody, everybody, everybody buys that because it tells you the form. Yeah. And so, I got lucky. I got, I, I got lucky. This, this, this script from this wonderful man named Norman Twain who took a shot on this young playwright, me. Yeah. People in Hollywood read the script and it led to other jobs and I would get a little $2,000 job here, a $1,000 job there, a little rewrites. And then in 1993, my wife and I moved out to LA because I was writing more and more. 1995, I, I was hired by Paul Haggis for a show called Easy Streets, and I've been writing and directing since then. It's been, it's been good. So I was wondering what you're, you know, how you met Paul. Um, he was an amazing uh, screenwriter and director and- um, well. It, it's 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 a good lesson for writers. Um, mm -hmm. That play that I told you about, Half Deserted Streets, I decided I wanted to get into film more, so I went home and I wrote a spec script based on that. Bring, like, yeah, okay, just take them in. That's what you got to do. So forgive me, my grandson. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I wrote that spec script. And Paul Haggis was looking to find a writer for this show called Easy Streets. And Mark Harris, Paul's partner, was also looking to find a writer. And they wanted New York writers. And who knows uh, how lucky I was, but there was, a, there was an actor by the name of uh, Bo Starr who had done Paul's show called Due South and had given Paul my script and said, this is a writer you should look at. I'm sorry, that's my that's my dog now. I apologize. Let me close the door. We have a dog too. <laughs> so Mark Harris, crazy coincidence, somebody else had given him my same script. So the two producers on the show had, were both reading my script. Wow. wow. You know, that doesn't happen often. I mean, what you're saying is just, you know, obviously you're very talented and you, and, you know, you were maybe ready to make that step because a lot of writers or actors are not ready to go super pro, you know. Um, you have to be ready for those chances. Uh, and you seem to, you know, it just seemed that you were ready and you were passionate and you were, uh, you had some luck behind you too. Um, a lot of a lot of luck, uh, but don't don't forget this 1995, and I started in seventy, so that's 25 years of trying to understand something about the craft. And yeah, I, 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 overnight sensation. Oh, yeah, you're years. not. It never <laughs> is, but there yeah. are a lot of people. Uh, God bless them that um, don't uh, are not always ready for that next level, um, yeah. and and you could freak out. I mean. When when you were asked to write something, um, I think you said before. Uh, how did you how did you sit down? You said you never wrote before. Um, how did you sit down? What was the process? Do you remember how you um, organized, situated for writers out there who are listening to this? Um, how did you? How were you able to deliver? You're talking about screenplays or plays? Yeah, screenplay. Screenplay. Yeah. 
the, the first thing that every writer who wants to write a screenplay should know is that the form is intimidating and actually the form doesn't mean anything. It's the easiest thing to take on. It's just a weight, it's a tool. It's like a hammer, it's like a screwdriver. Learn how to use a hammer or a screwdriver. Learn how to use the form in screenwriting. So get that out of you. It scared the hell out of me for weeks or months until I realized, oh, this is not that hard. You got a couple of little rules here. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about that. It's about what you have to say as an artist, what, what you have to say as a human being. Yeah. Um, and the trick is to ask yourself, what does this story have to do with me? What do I care about in this story in terms of my own thoughts, my own feelings, my own loves, my own hates, and then bring that to the page. And that that takes a long time. It I, does. Was, I was fortunate enough to have done that with my play that I told you was produced. I, I took wow. my own history, what happened with my brother, what happened with my family, what happened with me and my wife and kids. And I used all those things. And that's the trick. The real tools are not learning the form of a screenplay. The real tools are getting in touch with who you are, what you have to offer as a human being and as an artist and as a writer. Get in touch with that and bring that to the page. You know, that is so true because I, I started writing about five years ago and I just started to say, you know what, enough with this, like you said, you know, um, what you're supposed to, to do and whatever. I just started writing organically about my life experiences, who I knew, because sometimes life is better than fiction. And if I really know those people that I once knew and write about them, I can have that emotional connection. I can peek through that emotional connection or even my own life, because you said you lost your brother and I've lost my sister and I lost all my family, basically. I'm the only one left in my family. And I when I do write, I have that antenna um, now, more so now than I did when I first started writing, because um, I am also an actress. And I just said, you know what? I'm tired of waiting for the phone to ring. I need to write. I need to write. I have so much more to give in my soul and my passion as an artist. And, and that's what happened with me. Well, I told you, because yeah. I also write too. And I say, well, just start writing. You know, and well, I've never written before. Well, just start writing. You yeah, know, you got a crazy family. You know, just start, start writing. You know. <laughs> but you know, and that's very true. And I think that uh, anyone could take away um, what you said is just so true that it's your passion. If if you don't care about the characters, no one will. And I was going to ask you about your characters. How do you? Um, you know, flush them, out. flush them out. What's your, you know, do you, do you write them out by the characters or do you just start with a story or how, what's your method? I think everything is different. Uh, every, every project it's different. Um, I have a, a movie now that I've finished writing as a producer on board. We're putting together the finances. Uh, I finished it a while back. We're not allowed to write now, you know, the WGA, we're on strike. Yeah. Luckily, I, I finished this movie months ago and the producers uh, on board getting it out there and it's a story about Lucky Luciano, the gangster from 1920s and 30s. Yeah. So with a project like that, you do all the research you can in terms of the character of Lucky. Mm -hmm. You find out what his orbit was, who was in his orbit, what was the beginning, what brought him to New York, what was it like before he got to New York, what was the end of his life like? And so that's all about that character and anybody involved with his character and his journey. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, unless it's a, I, I did another movie called Lamborghini, which was kind of like that, and, you know, story about Lamborghini, what's his orbit, what's his life, what's his arc like, where did he begin, where did he go, how did he end? Um, not necessarily that you have to use all those things, beginning, middle, and end of one's life. You should know it, though, and decide what part of the story you want to tell. With Lucky, I do. Uh, I, I told beginning, middle, and end from when he left Sicily to New York and then back at Sicily at the end of his life. With Lamborghini, it's a 20-year period or something. It's just a little section of his life. When it's not based on a character, when you have an idea mm. of something, um, then it's a little different. Then you ask yourself, what's this idea about? How do I want to dramatize it? Where do I want to put it? What's important? And then you start exploring the nature of what it is that you want to go after. 
Um, there's a there's an, another movie that I'm putting together, uh, cast wise, that I wrote a while back that has to do with the world of hockey. I grew up outside Madison Square Garden, so it was a world that I understood and loved. Yeah, uh, you know, so that began with oh, there's a hockey story that meshes with something else, uh, a young hockey phenom and his father who's caught up in the mafioso world. Uh, and his father's life keeps getting into the way of this kid's life as a phenom hockey player. It's based on a true story. Right. Now you got the idea. Oh, this is about a father's son. The father's life is interfering on the son's dream. Now you chase everything from that dream. So it's not, that's not about a character. That's about an idea. So you find out what you're after first, and then you explore it. And sometimes you think you're after one thing, and you do all the research, and you realize, oh, I'm after something else. And you then you run with that. Don't don't lock yourself into some idea. Oh, this is my idea, and then you shut everything else out. Right. Especially in the early stages, anybody who's listening to this, leave yourself open. There's magic that happens when you leave yourself open to stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I was writing one movie that I thought was about one thing and then i realized oh no that's a faustian tale um you know faust the legend of faust mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so uh in finding that i found the movie it had nothing to do with the original idea so yeah. you gotta leave yourself open but ideas can come from anywhere anywhere you, you know um another one somebody sent me a book two years ago and uh, I knew that I should not write it because it was female oriented. So I stayed on as the director. I found two female writers and we now have a script that's pretty cool uh, that when the strike is over, we'll try to get that movie done. So it can come from anywhere. Yeah, it can. Now, Bobby, uh, tell us, the, when you do you write every day? Do you write like four hours a day? Do you do it in the morning, afternoon? If, I have, if I have a job, if I have something that has a deadline, I'm at my desk i wake up in the morning i have coffee i walk around and hope that i can get away from working and i know that i can't and i sit down at my desk and i work for about four or five hours uh, i have lunch um, maybe i'll take a short nap then i'll come back and i'll work till about six o'clock then i'll have dinner with my family and then right before bed i'll come in and i'll put another hour or two and looking at what i did on the day's work and then you know just a quick look at what's coming up tomorrow and let the subconscious work on tomorrow's work that's that's when I'm when I have a deadline, uh, or when I'm actually into the idea. Once you got the idea and the outline, that's my schedule. Yeah. So talk about collaboration, because right now I'm collaborating with another writer, and I know you did collaborate with Paul Haggis. Um, my personal feeling is that I, you know, you you work together, and you may not agree on how the direction of the story will go. How do you um, work with- How do you work with that situation? That situation. Because there are people who do collaborate with other people. Yeah, you know, I've collaborated with many people many mm -hmm. times. It's a real simple rule. Give up your ego. The best idea wins. <laughs> uh, it, it's that simple. If you have a relationship, Paul and I worked together 20 years or 25 years together. Uh, and hope to work together in the future sometime, you know, when the strike is over and things work out for him personally. Um, I, I, you know, we never had an argument because neither one of us ever held on to an idea. We discussed oh, whatever's best for the script, whatever's best for the story, that's what goes in. It doesn't matter where the idea comes from. When somebody says, you know, I liked my idea, the minute you use the word my in a relationship in writing, you're dead. Or mm -hmm. the word yours. It's all about what's the best idea and the best idea wins. Who gives a shit where it came from? And that's hard. That's a lot harder than, to do than people think it is. But you've got to give up your ego. You've got to only care about the story. If you care, I had a, a collaborator say to me once, give me this one, okay? Let me get this idea into the script. And that was the end of our relationship. If this is about you getting your idea in as opposed to a great story, this no longer works. And we say goodbye. Yes. That's it. Simple as that. So I mean, this, that's the only rule for collaboration. I worked with a, as an actor in a film. It was an independent. I won't mention the name of the film, but uh, the guy that wrote the script, he collaborated with another writer and he kept getting um, the other writer wanted what he wanted. And because he was new and he, he wasn't sure of himself. Completely changed. He completely changed the Got script the way the other writer wanted it. 
when he saw the film, he was very disappointed. Um, not that it was a bad film, but it wasn't the vision that he wanted. And um, I think sometimes, you know, you do have to speak up. You do have to say, hey, you know, we're in this together. And like you said, it should be like a marriage, you know, give and take and not say this is how it's going to go and that's it. Um, it's a meritocracy. It has to be. Yeah. Whatever the best idea wins. That has to be the answer. Now, there is one cautionary moment that should take place in any collaboration, which is the two partners have to sit down and say, what's the movie we're after? And if you're both trying to make the same movie, it's a lot easier. But if you have two different ideas for the movie, you're dead. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, do you want to tell us about the, the actor's gym? The Actors Gym, as I said a little while ago, started up when I went to Los Angeles and trying to make a living as an actor in 1974. Uh, and for three years out there, just got tired of just auditioning or not getting an audition. And I thought, I should open up a company where people could just come and work because auditioning once a month or once every six weeks, you know, you're not, you're not an actor. Yeah. You know? And sure enough, there were a bunch of other actors feeling the same way. Bobby Costanzo, Kevin Dobson from Kojak, Joe Santos, oh, wow. yeah. Joe Santos from the Rockford Files, Leo Rossi, just a bunch of old, old Floyd Levine, New York actors. Um, and we all got together. We rented up. We paid some dues to each other to pay for the theater. And we met once a week. And... Uh, more and more, I kind of became the moderator because when everybody else, somebody else was moderating, there was a lot of fighting going on. And for some reason, I held people to not, to not fight. Uh, I won't get into why that was the case. You're like a consigliere. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and so that broke up after a year. But 1977, I liked it. It was a good idea. I opened it on my own. I called it Bobby Moresco's Actors Gym. And it's a place where actors, writers, and directors come to work. They put the work up every week, whether it's acting, writing, or directing. And then if they choose to, we can open it up to the members of the company to offer what they can to make it a better piece of work, or we can just move on. The work is enough. It's lasted now almost 48 years, uh, whatever so it is. You still have it in New York and LA? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we meet every Thursday afternoon. We've got, uh, I don't know. 100 people or something every week. It's an oh, amazing thing. Wow. And so, lots of, you know, we developed Million Dollar Baby there. We developed Crash there. We developed Falcone. You spoke about it earlier at the Actors Gym. There's a big thank you for Crash at the uh, in the credits. If you look at it, there are 13 actors from the Actors Gym uh, in the movie Crash. That's really great. Wow. Yeah. That's really great. And it's nice to give back, you know. It's nice to give back. Well, you know, they were part of the process, you know. We, yeah, we, exactly. You know, and, and they're all good actors, you know. You can't give back if it doesn't work for the movie. What I said earlier, you know, it, it's got to be the best idea wins for the movie. Same with casting. You can, you know, you, oh, can, yeah. like, you can like people and want to give back, but if they're not right for the part and the movie, it doesn't help. I'm yeah. just going to ask you about actors. Um, and since you were an actor... When you see an actor auditions for one of your movies, what do you look out for? Because I know there's going to be a lot of actors looking at this. Um, and I'm sure that they would like to know, and I would like to know too, um, what is it that grabs you when you see someone's work and you really want to work with them? What is it that makes you say that person's the right person? Well, first of all, you hope they're right for the part. Yes. People, yeah. you know, a actors often make the wrong assumption that they're going to walk in and the the, acting, the casting director and the director are not going to like them right away for whatever reason. I don't know why actors think that, but they do. And they're security. wrong. They're, yeah. they're wrong because when I'm directing a movie or a television show, I want to hire the first person that walks in the door so I can go back out and do the rest of my work. I don't want to sit and I don't want to see any more actors. I want you to be the one. So you have to understand that's what you're walking into, not negativity, but positivity. The other thing is that the first thing I look for, assuming that person is right for the part, is this somebody I want to work with. Do I want to spend 12 hours a day with this person for the next six weeks or whatever the schedule is? And if not, it's going to be hard to win me over with your acting if I don't like what just walked into the room. And I, So, you know, just know that first impressions go a long way. 
Uh, and even though you want the best actor, you also want somebody you want to work with. You don't want to be fighting every day with somebody. Yeah, someone likable. And uh, what and is it um, that actors do that gets under your skin when they walk into an audition or uh, you can always do, it's the, it's always the same thing. It's not being who they are being, you know, you, you walk in, you can see you're putting on a show to make me like you. The, first, the, the easiest way for me not to like you is for you to try to make me like you. Just be who yeah, you are. Be you have you. nothing else to offer anyway, but who you are and what you've done with the work. Trust that. Walk in. How are you? Nice. Thanks for being here. Uh, you look at the script. I did. Any questions? No, I think I got a shot at it. Great. Let's do it. Simplicity. Because that's what the job's got to be. When I show up on a set, I know, uh, and you come and I, I look at you and say, you, you're good, you got questions? No, I'm good, I've done my work. Thank you, I want an actor who's done his work. Homework, yeah. yeah. And then the second thing, and the most important thing out of all of it, is when an actor sits down and reads, is he in touch with the instrument? Does he really talk? Does he really listen? And is he in touch with the center of what he has to offer as an actor? Or is he reaching? Is he outside himself? Um, and if he's outside himself at the audition, he'll be outside himself at the job. And you can't hire somebody who's not in touch with the instrument. So those are the things. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you work on TV shows and you work on film sets, what's the difference um, in creating a TV show uh, as opposed to a movie? As opposed to a movie, is the process different? Um, obviously, there's a lot of rewrites. Um, is that something that you enjoy doing, or is it just too crazy TV, or is it better in, on a you know a set, a movie set, things like that? What's the comparables of um, creating a show for TV versus? Do you like one as opposed to the other? No, I like it all. I, I'm I, whenever I'm working on something, shooting, I'm grateful to be working. It's uh, you know all of us spend a lot of time developing projects, uh, mostly in the movie field. I mean, Million Dollar Baby took four years, Crash took four years, <clears throat> Lamborghini took a couple of years. Um, the difference in TV is you get a go usually. You, you know, sometimes you'll write a pilot on spec. I mean, um, you know, movies you write spec all the time. Crash was, Crash was a spec script. <clears throat> Million Dollar Baby was a spec script, um, wow. so you know you'll 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 write a script in the film business. You won't in TV. In TV, what you'll write is your out you know your outline for the pilot, your pitch. You'll put together a pitch deck, and then you'll have something called the Bible, and the Bible tells you what happens uh, in a pretty clear and distinct way for season one for each of the characters. You have a character arc for who the main people are, and then you get a general look at the first. You know three to four seasons so um the difference is in movies you start with a spec script often or somebody hires you to write a script and you're on your own in tv you're never on your own really you know you, you you've hired a bunch of other writers to be in the writing room you're always dealing with executives from the studio you're always dealing with executives from the network although now studios and networks are Sometimes and more often than not the same, but that's another story. And so, uh, you know, you're always collaborating in TV much more than you are in film when you're writing a script. Uh, and so that's that's the big difference. Um, if you're the showrunner, which, you know, I've been on my shows um, since Falcone, which was 1997 after Millennium and after Easy Streets. Um, when you're the showrunner, you've got a lot to do you know you in a movie you've got one story one main character for the most part sometimes you've got more more stories uh, like crash but for the most part you got one story and then you you concentrate on that in film i mean in tv you've got the show you're writing as a showrunner even if you've hired writers you're on top of that you've got the show that you're the episode you're in post on and then you've got the episode that you're in prep on for next week and then you're developing six scripts later so you're dealing with six seven eight ten arcs um ten storylines which is really hard guys really hard so you don't have a life. i remember talking <laughs> to um when i when we lived out in los angeles where we met you um i became friends with joe davola sure 
So he was telling me the same thing. It's, 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 but that's the difference. We, you know, we, in the movies, it's more, especially writing, there's more solitary aspect to it. Now, if you're hired by a studio, if you're hired by, uh, you know, uh, a financier who's giving you the money, which often happens too, you turn the script and then you get notes. There's a collaboration involved. But in the beginning, it's almost always just you, unless you have a collaborator you're writing with, like Paul and I. Th those are the big differences, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What, what would you say in regards to, I mean, now because of new technology and all that, what would be your um, advice to, you know, people who want to go out and make a movie? Go make a movie. That's the answer. They, they don't know how lucky they are sometimes, I think. When I started out in film and TV, uh, it was after I started out in stage. And what I did with the actors, Jim, is I went, I had to write and direct and produce the shows at the actors' gym because nobody else was doing it. Yeah. And so I would I would grab thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, you know. And at that time, theater owners would take a down payment and take the rest of the money from the rental from the uh, people coming in during the week. And so we did plays for a thousand dollars. Now you can do a whole movie for a thousand dollars. Go make a movie, tell stories, write them. If you, you, you want your know, iPhone. In today's world, there's nothing stopping you from making a movie except you. If you're going to wait for somebody to give you a job or tell you, I want your movie, you're never going to do it. Go do it. That's the answer. Yeah, I even think actors have to do it. I mean, you have to write your own content, actors. Actors have to be more of a filmmaker, writer, producer, producer right? whatever you want to call yeah, it, even interacting. Yeah, you, it's pretty much expected uh, nowadays. Uh, I know when I started acting, nobody had the opportunities that young people have today. I mean, we had to wait for the phone call. You know, I mean, it, we, you know, it was a different world. Technology just wasn't there. It just cost too much money to do a film. But you're right, today, I did a sizzle reel for 500 bucks. Cast, crew, everything, location, everything. Well, because I added to it. <laughs> yeah, because he edits. But the thing of the matter is, it, it took a lot of work. Uh, I'm not saying it didn't. But uh, for $500, I mean, I was able to hustle and wheel and deal and get something on camera, my vision, and it was cheap. If I was to do that 20 years prior, I would have had to spend at least 10 grand. At least. So yeah, that's, you know, look, we're in the most competitive business in the world. Every Everybody who's ever done anything, Tom Brady went into broadcasting, you can bet he'll be doing movies soon. Everybody, you know, everybody wants in on the act. Magic Bronson have done movies. Michael Jordan has done movies. These are people who have more money than anybody else in the world. They have more talent and they're attracted to the movie business because the movie business is the most glamorous business on the face of the earth. And so you're up against all of that as an actor, writer, or director. So if you're not going to outwork the competition, just go do something else. Go yeah. do something else because it's too hard, guys. It's too hard. You know, even if you work your butt off for 40 or 50 years and you're better and more talented than everyone else, there is still no guarantee. Oh. So to do it halfway, to say, you know, I don't want to do it all to get it done, go do something else. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. How was it like to work with Clint Eastwood? Uh, he was directed awesome. Million Dollar Baby. He's the uh, nice, nicest man in the world, Clint Eastwood. He knows exactly what he wants. He shows up on set. Everybody is ready to go. There's nobody playing any games. So, you know, he says to the actors, are you ready? He never says cut. He just says to the actors, are you ready? And the actors go, yes. And you do two, maybe three takes. And he says, yeah, that's good for me. And he says to the actors, is that good for you? And all the actors are saying, yeah, it's good for you, Clint. It's good for me. He and actually he says, asked them? Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, and uh, and uh, yeah, no. If somebody wants another take, sometimes he'll say why. Um, you know, you trust him as a director; he's got a good eye. And then he goes home about two in the afternoon, which I don't know any other director does that. Wow! <laughs> and a movie set. <laughs> wow! Because wow. he knows he knows who he is. He knows what he wants, um, and he makes whatever. You know, he's he's a very clear-headed, smart guy, and he's a good guy, and never disrespectful to anyone. Never raises his voice. There's no shouting on a Clint Eastwood set. There's no hollering. 
the AD walks around and says, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. There's no screaming, no shouting. Nothing like that. All positive energy, yeah. You're all positive. I mean, that's a really nice way of treating actors. Hey, do you, you know, do you want to do it again? A lot of directors don't do that. They just move on uh, or I think more, more more than you think, I think. More, well, you know, I you know, I, I would assume not none of them. I I could be wrong. Um, but I certainly before I move on, I, I say to every actor, you know. I'm good. You good? You need anything else? Always. If they say they want more, I give them one more. That's really um, nice. I, yeah, I think most directors, uh, I think most directors do it, except for, you know, if it's a character-oriented piece, if it's, you know, if it's the science fiction stuff, it's the, if it's the Marvel stuff, there's nothing to ask the actors, man. They're barely in it anyway. How do you feel about special effects now? I mean, it's pretty much over, you know, there's not, you look in a movie and it's all this special effects now, there's not a whole lot of story. Um, and sometimes I get very disappointed. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering how you feel about how special effects has overcome the, the, the art of filmmaking. I mean, you know, I'm not sure that I agree that it's overcome the art. It, it's grabbed all the air in the room, that's for sure. The Marvel comics and the big Disney stuff and all that stuff, but look, there, there's an audience. They, the reason that it's grabbed all the air in the room is because there's an audience out there. You know, this is called show business and the people who put up the money want their money back and more. I, I get it, you know, it's never been that much different. People are angry about all of the special effects movies, you know, taking over the world and how many times you're gonna see the world destroyed and then come back again, you know, you get, you get tired of it. It's not. It's not something that I enjoy. Um, but there's a there's an audience out there. Anybody who thinks it's going to go away, it ain't going to go away until the audience goes away, and then they'll make. You know, the people with the money will make other movies. Um, this well, is um. This is kind of a little controversial. Um, how do you feel about AI? Uh, you know, I, I think it's also blown out of proportion to a certain extent unless we get hold of it the director's guild i'm a member of the director's guild as well as a writer uh, the director's guild has you know put a real strong handle on what ai can do and what it can't do it's a human endeavor this writing directing business um and uh, the writer's guild is going to fight for the same thing the actors i hope that they fight for the same thing because you know they're the easiest to manipulate through ai I'm not an actor anymore. I'm not in SAG anymore. But I hope that SAG stops it in its place, as the D DJ did uh, with the contract this year that we've agreed to. But if 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 SAG allows AI to move forward in an unprecedented way without really keeping a tight rein on it, actors will lose so much work, it'll be so sad. And I hope it doesn't happen. I guess what I'm saying is actors need to strike unless they get everything they want. We do need Now's to strike. Now's the time to stop it. Yeah. You're not gonna be, you're not, if you don't stop it now, if the actors don't stop it now and the writers don't stop it now, that's why we're on strike. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to be able to put it back in the bottle. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I mean, the world is so crazy. Um, and actors, you know, we've been replaced by cartoons and, you know, anyone can dub our voice and change the way we look. And um, even when somebody does special effects, we have an actor friend, you know, and he said, look, you know, you manipulated my body, you changed my head, you, you know, and you keep my voice, but you don't pay me for the extra. That's, that's what I'm talking about right yeah. now. And, you know, if SAG doesn't change all of that now, and if they don't do that now, They'll never get it. They're just giving away the acting profession. Yeah, that's true. So you have any more questions? No, that's it. Yeah. I think, uh, I Do you think have any final thoughts uh, to say uh, whatever is on your mind? Um, you don't want to know what's on my mind. It's a frightening thing. <laughs> uh, so listen, uh, it was good talking to you guys. I wish you nothing but the best with the podcast, okay? Well, yeah, thank you, Bobby. We appreciate for you. appreciate it. Right. I'll send you the link when it's uh, when it's up. Okay, thanks very much. Take care Thank of yourself. Thank you for Bye. being on our podcast. Thank, Thank you, Bobby. you. Bye bye, Bobby. Good luck with everything.